Good evening. It just got dreadfully silent in here. It's uh, <clears throat> my pleasure to call this August group uh, to order um, for the April 26th Board of Education meeting. Um, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Commissioner Millard to do introductions for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Superintendent Pufal. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Hank Schmelz, the uh, principal at Marshall Middle School. He joined School District of Janesville as the Marshall Middle School principal during the 21 or during the 2021 school year. Prior to joining the School District of Janesville, Mr. Schmelz served as six years at Phoenix Middle School in Delavan as the principal and was the principal at Hamilton Middle School in Madison for nine years prior. He has a tank has a Hank has a teaching degree and he has taught seven through 12 social studies before moving into administration. This is his 32nd year serving public schools, 12 years in California and 20 years in Wisconsin. Mr. Schmelz holds a bachelor's degree in social studies from California State University, Sacramento, and a master's degree in administration from the National University. Mr. Schmelz, who do you have with you this evening? I have Mr. Lucas Short. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lucas. He's a fantastic seventh grade scholar from Marshall Middle School who is here with his mother, Pauline Cast. Lucas is a two-year member of our student council and the advisor reports that his valuable ideas and positive spirit gets the other members motivated. So he's also a baritone vocalist in our jazz choir and has been on our tennis team. So with that, Lucas. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, I'd like to uh, nominate Kathy Meyer for board president. We have a nomination for Kathy Myers for board president. Are there any further nominations for board president? <laughs> Are there any further nominations for president? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, now we'd like to, oops, now we'd like to um, call for nominations for uh, Vice President of the Board of Education. Commissioner Hanawal. I'd like to nominate Jim Millard for Vice President. Okay. Do we have any further nominations for Vice President? Doing the pause. Do we have any further nominations for vice president? 
Okay, hearing none, nominations are closed. All those in favor of the election of Jim Millard as Vice President of the Board of Education, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, the same sign. Okay, so I uh, declare Jim Millard as Vice President of the Board of Education. Congratulations, Jim. Okay, so now we're going to call for the nomination of board clerk. Clerk for the uh, of clerk for the board of education. Do I have nominations for clerk for the board of education? Commissioner Dahmer tells us. I will nominate Michelle again. She's done a wonderful job, and I'd like to keep it there. Okay, thank you. Are there any further nominations for clerk? Any further nominations for Clerk of the Board of Education? Okay, hearing none, nominations are closed. All those in favor of the election of Michelle Hayworth as Clerk of the Board of Education signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations, Michelle. Okay, now I'd like to call for a nomination for treasurer of the Board of Education. Commissioner Dommerhausen? I'd like to nominate Greg Ardry as the treasurer of our board. Thank you. Are there any further nominations for treasurer of the Board of Education? Are there any further nominations for the treasurer of the Board of Education? Okay, hearing none, nominations are closed. All those in favor of the election of Greg Ardry as uh, treasurer of the Board of Education signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? All right, congratulations, Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, so safety message, Commissioner Herta. Thank you. I'm going to apologize beforehand for my raspy voice, but obviously I talk too much. <laughs> I knew that would bring a laugh, yes. Um, so April, uh, my safety message is about uh, April being Distracted Driving Awareness Month. I thought this was a fitting topic um, since... One, April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month, but also because I recently drove back to, um, to La Crosse and back last weekend with my son for a campus close-up tour. Um, I will admit that I was a little stressed getting into the car as we started our return home as it was getting late in the afternoon. It had been a long day on the college campus, and I really wasn't looking forward to the three-hour trek home on the interstate. So simply put, stress was a factor, um, and I probably have to mention that my Bluetooth wasn't connecting to my car either, so that just added a little bit more stress because my Google Maps wasn't working. So we all know that our phones, passengers, and other drivers can be major factors behind the wheel, but research dis discovered a new risk factor on the road, stress. In fact, stress driving can be as risky as texting while driving. Stress is on the rise. Americans are experiencing extremely high levels of stress and anxiety as a result of the pandemic, which has been a contributor to the rise in vehicle crashes and traffic deaths, actually up 12% from 2020 to 2021, according to the National Highway Safety Administration. I'd also like to share some profound statistics by Accident Analysis and, and Prevention Group on how our emotions impact us when driving. 33% of people have pulled over because they felt too emotional to drive. 40% of drivers feel more anxious driving than they did before the pandemic. And 54% of people have cried during driving. I can raise my hand for that one. So you might say, you know, what are some self-care tips behind the wheel for when stress starts to creep in? So I have three to share with you tonight. I like the first one, calming music. Researchers at Stanford University have found that listening to music seems to be able to change brain functioning to the same extent as medication. This is because music around 60 beats per minute can cause the brain to synchronize with the beat, causing alpha brain waves, the same brainwave frequency present when we are relaxed and conscious. 
So an action might be for you to create a calming Spotify playlist in your near future. Second self-care tip is simply take a deep breath. Inhale through your nose and into our bellies is a proven way to reduce stress. This is because when you breathe deeply, it sends a message to your brain to naturally calm you down and relax. And the third self-care tip is one I try to tell myself each and every day on the road is to activate your empathy. Try to take a moment after those deep breaths and that calming music to help humanize and empathize with the other drivers on the road. They are under stress too, just like you are. So in complete transparency, I did none of the above while driving home from La Crosse <laughs> last week with my son. So hopefully in the future and some stressful driving situations I'm sure I will encounter, I will also remember music, breathing, and empathy are keys to keeping everyone safe on the roads. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Good tips. Okay. Um, citizen comments. We have only one on our list today. Um, Tammy Stevens. Hi, Ms. Stevens. Um, would you please uh, give us your name and address uh, before you begin? Uh, my name is Tammy Stevens, and I live at 3419 Royal Road in Jeansville. Um, I also am going to email this to you, um, as I have before, just because I know it's a lot, and I did time it, so... I'm here to advocate for myself and my colleagues in respect to a request for a new and appropriate pay scale. I am the mother of two children who have gone through our district, one on the special education track who is now 24 and one on the neurotypical track. She is now 22 with a degree in early childhood. I have worked at Lincoln Elementary for the past 19 years as a special education paraprofessional and have also worked within that time as an instructional aide. <clears throat> I am well versed in both sides as an employee and a parent, and I do understand the need to run a fiscally responsible district. I want to give you a glimpse of the work I do, and I want to encourage you to address and approve a pay increase for the paraprofessionals employed by our district. My job, while very rewarding, and if you know me, you know I absolutely love and advocate for all children in our program, is very demanding, not only physically, but mentally. Lifting students, bathrooming, bathing, chasing those that are prone to eloping, behaviors that include hitting, spitting, kicking, biting, and even gagging themselves in self-harm. We mentally try to sort out all their behaviors and triggers and helping students become su successful in all areas, including homeroom attendance. Learning sign language for our hearing impaired learners as well as our learners with cognitive disabilities and continuing to work through COVID-19 with the most vulnerable students who aren't able to wear masks. Covering for multiple staff daily as the substitute pairs have been ne nearly non-existent this year. We also spend quite a bit of time outside of work researching ways to help our students be more successful in the school environment. We look for resources with our own money and time that can help our students. An example, a treadmill to help them regulate adrenaline and sensory needs, rocking chairs for stimming, etc. I also assist in lesson planning, offering ways to improve or new things to try. I also complete any professional development hours that are applicable to my position on my own time. And I consider myself to be a valuable resource for both school staff and parents. I've assisted many other parents with resources and ideas to use at home. And I believe that this in turn helps our students be successful in the school environment as well. Due to my ongoing professional relationship with a parent of a student in our program, I have been able to gain that parent's trust and provide respite care. This is obviously outside of my paid hours, but highlights the high needs in our program as our parents have a very small circle of people that they trust with their children. Since the advent of Act 10, over 10 years ago in 2011, I have not received any sort of pay raise that is unrelated to the minimal cost of living increase we get annually. The work is hard and compensating us through appropriate wages is the first step in retaining more quality staff. It takes years to do our job with the correct knowledge and skills and it is costly every time we have to hire and train new staff. We need an appropriate pay scale. Additionally, the wage premium for being a special education paraprofessional needs to be put back into place. What's the incentive to do a much harder, more physically demanding job if I'm not paid that premium? Why am I required to obtain a special education license if I'm not being compensated for my skill set and knowledge? It is disheartening to know that I could get a job at Hoppy Lobby for more than I am making here with 19 years of experience. And I definitely don't want to leave. I can only speak here for myself, but I know that I have many other colleagues that echo my sentiments and are afraid to speak up. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we're um, at the point of our student <coughs> presenters. Um, our first presenter comes from Arise Virtual Academy. It's Meadow Zoak. Welcome, Meadow. Hello. 
Good afternoon. My name is Meadows Oak and I'm a junior at Arise Virtual Academy. I started Arise earlier this year and the school has continuously positively impacted my academic career and it's helped me to put in a position where I can graduate early at the end of this year. Arise has allowed me a lot of flexibility to adjust the amount of classes I'm taking, what classes I'm taking, and overall ensure a positive academic experience on my end. The staff at Arise has been countlessly willing to work with me and my schedule to work at the most productive times and to prioritize my academics and life responsibilities. One thing I appreciate about Arise is the one-on-one -on -one relationship between students and teachers that allows students the opportunity to feel comfortable asking for help or support when, teacher, when needed. I have always felt at Arise like I have had an important voice when it comes to my academic choices and that that voice has been continuously valued and respected. Due to Arise, I was able to fulfill working during the school year while earning the credits needed to graduate early, and I'm grateful for the countless opportunities the school has presented me to succeed. I've learned so many valuable skills that I will take with me into my life, for one, putting up with Dr. Parr. If I can put up with Parr, I can put up with anyone. <laughs> I can't wait to see the lasting positive impacts that Arise has had on me. Since our last board meeting, the ABA held a holiday party at the Boys and Girls Club. We had about 60 students in attendance. Students played bingo, took pictures with Santa, decorated cookies, and more. For the culminating activity, the middle school read the book Wonder. We had a Wonder movie night. Sixth through eighth grade students were invited. Many brought their families with them. Continuing activities, game nights take place two times a month on Wednesdays from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Arise Middle School and high school students come together at the Arise Lab for a little healthy competition, and that is fun while playing games. Coming up, we have several field trips and activities planned, such as the JSOL first and second grade field trip on May 31st, Junkyard Wars at BTC, where three to four students will be representing Arise on May 20th, the Milton High School Trade Fair on May 13th, students will be attending the Trades Fair in Milton. All School Picnics is on June 2nd at 11 a.m. at Peace Park. Our graduation will be on May 26th at 6 p.m. in the Parker Large Auditorium. This year, we will again have a 100% graduation rate with 33 students graduating. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We also have today uh, from Rock River Charter School, Emily Richardson. Welcome, Emily. Good evening, Mr. Pufu, uh, school board meeting commissioners, members of the community. My name is Emily Richardson, and I am a student of Rock River Charter School enrolled in a ramp program. I have helped raise funds for students like myself who don't have a voice. These are homeless youth. I speak, for, I speak to raise awareness and money to create a homeless youth shelter in Beloit. There, this is a very important for young men as there is no shelters dedicated to their needs. I came to RRCS because the chaos of traditional schools, including bullying and discrimination, just did not work for me. Rock River Charter offers me a safer environment to learn, to be myself, and a clear path to success. My plan after graduation is to be an apprentice as a tattoo artist. Rock River Charter Schools had, has had its highest enrollment ever this year. Cur oh, excuse me. Currently, 195 students attend Rock River Charter. We have had a total of 306 students enroll with us at some point. We are expecting a record number of graduates this year. We have already had 82 students graduate so far, and we are expecting well over 100 graduates by the end of the school year. Between students graduating and or successfully transi transitioning to another program or school, we hold steady, steady at a 92.86 success rate. In the GED 02 program, 101 GED tests have been passed out of 110 pa tests taken, given them, giving them a 92 pass rating. I, have, I am proud to state that the GED02 program and its teachers have been recognized by the Department of Public Instruction as exemplary examples of how GED02 programs are to be implanted in, sorry, implemented and run. E-learning students have successfully completed over 700 online classes in the pursuit of a high school diploma 
All seniors in this program are working to finish up classes for May and June graduation. The reading and, pro reading and math programs class, programming class is working hard to improve reading and math skills to meet GED02 requirements and will be taking the star reading and math assessments, assessments to determine fall placement within the next few couple weeks. The alternative education program at Rock River Charter continues to evolve and shift to meet the needs of the students. This year, the program piloted an AM PM session school day where half the students attend class in the AM and the other half attend the class in PM. With the ses within the session, school is run on an A and B schedule where on Mondays and Tuesdays, Mondays and Thursdays, students attend first, second, and third hour class periods. And on Tuesdays and Fridays, students attend fourth, fifth, and sixth hours. Wednesdays are set aside as a work, a work day or for RTI support. This model worked well and the staff at Rock River Charter have decided to implement it for the 2022 to 2023 school year. Rock River Charter Schools School continues to be the right choice for many students within the school district of Janesville who, have, who would otherwise, otherwise flounder at one of the traditional high schools. Our graduation celebration will take place at the Janesville Center of Performing Arts on May 31st at 6 p.m. We would love to see you all at the gra graduate our, our oh my goodness graduate our congratulate our graduates oh my goodness thank you for allowing me to take the time to speak to you about Rock River Charter. I would like to thank you for supporting your school. Thank you, Emily. And last but not least, we have from Tagos, David Cummings. Welcome, David. Good evening. My, uh, my name is David Cummings, and I am a senior at Tagos Leadership Academy. I came to Tagos when I was in ninth grade. Over the past four years, I've learned from Tagos uh, to be a more accepting and open person. When I came to Tagos, I was not a very social person and had trouble talking to other people. However, as time went on, the student body taught me to accept myself and others. Over the last four years, I've tried to be a lighthearted person, one who uh, gives everyone a chance. Along with my social growth, I have enjoyed having the opportunity to do projects on the subjects I have an interest in. For an example, I did a Vietnam War project relating to Agent Orange and the catastrophic effects it had on the Vietnam people and our troops. Another project I did was about epigenetics. This project was about the effects of the genes in a person that is uh, related to the behavior and environment during their childhood development. As I get closer to graduation, I have preparations for college that are set in place. I have just recently had my application for UW-Whitewater accepted, which I have my sights set on uh, for my future learning. I planned on studying information technology, and helping the world of uh, networking in whatever ways that are presented to me in my future. Students at Tagos participate in hands-on, real-world projects. This year, we have somewhat shifted our focus and are doing a combination of teacher-led and student-led projects. Each student will complete eight projects by the end of the year. Two of the teacher-led projects that we worked on this semester are There's What in My Water in Vertical Farming. The Water Project connected us with a live resource who is an investigative journalist who participated in researching the water flint crisis. Uh, additionally, our school took a trip to the wastewater treatment plants here locally in Janesville to enhance our understanding of our own local public works department. We also participated in a project about our civic duties where we were able to take a tour of a polling place and visit the city hall. We then participated in a mock city council meeting. In addition to our teacher-led projects, it is part of Tago's philosophy to honor students' individuality. Since my own interests are related to science and history, one of my projects related to history was studying the Aztec Empire and what it was like for them at the height of their golden age. My project was an interactive digital map of the largest city during their golden age. As we have made it through the 2021-2022 school year, we have learned to navigate our new normal in both our new location and in the midst of a pandemic. Although we are faced with some challenges, we have also found some success. This year, Tagus was given the honor of being identified as a school that exceeds expectations. Through hard work and perseverance, we have managed to work through dif the difficulties and embraced our opportunities. 
During this past year, I have persevered through the awkward times myself that were presented to us after the pandemic hit. Along with my time at Tagos, I took classes at Craig and was able to participate uh, both in swim and track. For swim, I had qualified for state two times in a row now, and uh, along with a few other of my teammates. And for track, I am currently in the middle of the season and I'm hoping to improve the rest of my team. Although this year has proved to have challenges, it has also taught me to understand that not everything is going to go as it seems. Many choices in life are presented, and not all of them may be the ones you want to make, but you need to push through them to move on and improve yourself. In closing, I would like to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I would like to invite all of you to visit Tago's Leadership Academy on May 18th, where we have our open house project night from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We welcome everyone to see how students at Tagos are taking ownership of their education by embracing personalized learning pathways that challenge our thinking and teach us to positively impact society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, it's moving on to the uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Okay, so. I've got Commissioner Ardry and then Commissioner Dahmerhausen. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did I put that spin on it? Okay. Sorry. Oh, all right. 3.1, we're going to recognize our winter athlete state qualifiers, Mr. McCormick and Mr. Kruger. On behalf of our Craig and Parker Athletic Departments, I would like to thank you for inviting us here tonight to recognize our student athletes and coaches who advanced the WIA State Tournament this past year. My name is Ben McCormick. I'm the Athletic Director at James McCraig High School. I'm also representing tonight uh, Clayton Krieger, the Parker AD who couldn't be here. He is ill tonight. Before I introduce our coaches, I would like to thank our athletes and families for their flexibility over the past couple of years with the challenges we've all faced due to COVID. I would like to thank the following people for making our athletics pro program a success year in and year out. Principal Lau Parker, uh, Principal Bianca Craig, and all of our assistant principals at both of those schools. Mr. Garner, Mr. Pufal, uh, Chris Nicholson does a great job at the district office. Both our Parker and Craig Athletic Booster Clubs, our Janesville community, and our entire school board for allowing our student athletes um, to compete and for your support. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce some of our coaches and several student athletes who recently qualified for the state tournaments. Uh, with all of our spring teams in action tonight, uh, we have everything going on tonight, baseball, softball, track and field, soccer, all of it tonight. So we have a number of coaches and student athletes who aren't able to be with us tonight as they're involved in multiple sports. Uh, but I'd just start to, I'd like to start by listing uh, the athletes from Parker High School, boys track and field from last June very quickly. And they are, and I, I think I have all the names right, but I apologize if I don't, Abathar Curry in the shot put. Keyshawn Pritchard in the high jump, uh, Trey Sand in the long jump, Maya Barnes in the 4x1, Janiah Everson in the 4x1 and long jump, Haley Kenyon in the 4x1, Emma Lippins in the 4x1, Brooke Payne in the 4x1, and Amber Scoville in the 4x1 and pole vault. From Craig last spring, we had three athletes advance in track and field, and they were senior Brian Bloomquist in the 1600 meter run. Junior Riley Coleman finished a second in the state in the 800 meter run, and also junior Jessa Alderman in the discus. And we did have one uh, male golfer in boys golf, Wyatt uh, Marshall, advanced in the state meet last spring. Now we can introduce some of our athletes. Um, this fall, if our uh, girls tennis team wants to come up from Parker High School, uh, Annie and Lucy Barnes. Um, these ladies had a six and six record as a doubles team and finished fourth in the Big Eight Conference, a very competitive conference. Uh, because of their successes during the regular season, they advanced to the WA State uh, Division I doubles tournament. Coach Steve uh, Mickelson said these ladies are represented, have represented Parker well and their positive demeanor, and he couldn't be more proud of how they performed. So Annie and Lucy Barnes. Uh, our Craig Tennis Girls, we had two. Senior Allison Grund and freshman Raya Ariazola both qualified as individuals to the WA State Tennis Tournament. Allison is a three-time state qualifier uh, as a senior, and Raya obviously has a bright future as she qualified as a ninth grader. Allison and Raya. <laughs> a 
Also in the fall, girls swim. Uh, from Craig, junior Allie Donegan qualified in the 200 and 500 free. And junior Dakota Reese, I think they're in opposite order, but Dakota's closest to me, qualified in the 50 and 100 free. And Coach Punzel said how excited she is to both have both these girls back next season. And also, Riley Coleman couldn't be here tonight because she's at a track meet, but she also qualified for Craig and cross country. Um, we also had one from the winter for Craig, couldn't be here. Olivia Rebout is a three-time state qualifier in gymnastics. Uh, she also has a track meet tonight. Um, Olivia holds a school record in bars at 9.575, which is outstanding, and she's a two-time sectional champion the past two seasons. You can stop listening to me talk now, and I'd like to introduce... Um, Parker boys from coach Eric Rhodes and he's going to introduce the athletes and then the coaches will pass off the microphone to the, the next coaches who are here and they'll introduce their athletes so thank you very much again for having us and, and uh, allowing us to recognize these student athletes so Eric Rhodes good evening I'm Eric Rhodes the head coach for Parker boys swim team and I'd like to introduce uh, Xander Raleigh he's a senior this year he qualified for state in the uh, 100 breaststroke, uh, also set a school record, and he's happy to say he's the first Parker student to break a minute in the 100 breaststroke. And uh, we're just very happy for him. He's uh, going on to bigger and better things. I don't think we've quite made a decision where he'd like to go or what he'd like to do. Over the years, I've liked to uh, it was an honor to have the kids swim in college um, after leaving. And now the way things are today, um, I'm happy if they're swimming in college, but uh, there are other things that could be more important and, and I'm just as happy as uh, if they're not swimming in college. But that's been uh, probably the biggest learning lesson I've had that was a big drive for me was to, you know, get you good, get you into college and, and swim there as a college athlete and uh, I'm a little bit more ambivalent about it now. Uh, just want to see the kids happy. And uh, thank you for all the years that you've uh, let me do this. I appreciate it. Sandra, I'd like to let you know what he's doing next year, please. Uh, so I actually have made a decision. I will be attending uh, UW Eau Claire, studying marketing and audio production, and also swimming for the team there. And then I'll then uh, introduce Matt Palma, the head coach for Janesville Craig swim team, and his <laughs> fellas. Um, thank you. So I'm going to introduce our Craig state swimmers this year. And returning to state for the second straight year is Ben Witt and David Cummings. Uh, and joining them are Nolan Schuf and Jameson Punzel. Um, all four of them uh, competed in the 400 freestyle relay, uh, and they finished fit in fifth place at the sectional, which qualified them for state. <clears throat> Additionally, Ben also qualified in the 100 fly and the 200 free individual event, uh, breaking his own school record in the 100 fly and winning the sectional uh, to qualify for state. Uh, he was also earned all state honors uh, for his success in that event as well. Um, David will be moving on. Um, he is our only senior. I believe he will be attending UW Whitewater and will be swimming there as well. Uh, and we're looking forward to next year having most of the team back, including Ben and the two freshmen. So, thank you. <laughs> and, now, and now I'll introduce Shane Fleming. Hello, I'm Shane Fleming, the head coach for Parker Wrestling. We had three student athletes qualify for their state meets this year. So one of them is Caden Brandenburg, who is at a track meet tonight. He's only a sophomore, qualified. We're expecting really big things out of Caden. He's an outstanding wrestler, so the bar is set very high for him. So hopefully 
getting that experience in as a sophomore is only going to help him succeed in the future. So that's what we got for him. And we have these two young ladies that kind of made history this year. They had the first ever female state wrestling tournament. So they both qualified for that. It's uh, Vanna Campman and Tracy Kessler. Vanna got a couple wins in the cross at the state meet. She had an outstanding year for us. Tracy wrestled varsity for us all year and placed fourth at the state tournament. So she got a medal, got on the podium, which is outstanding. Great year. She's still undecided what she's doing for college, but she's working on that. She's only a junior, so she's got more time, right? <laughs> so yeah, that was outstanding. They made, you know, the mental toughness that they gained by wrestling the boys all year, it's very unique. They have to wrestle against the guys all the time. So they're very strong-willed women and it's outstanding. So congratulations, ladies. <laughs> now I'll introduce Coach Bolt from Craig for wrestling. Hello, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Hunter Cleats. He's a senior uh, captain. He wrestled at 138 pounds for us this year. He won the Whitewater Tournament, West Dallas Tournament, and was a Big A Conference champ. He took third at regionals, and then ended up uh, getting back in the wrestling room that Monday, working on stuff, and ended up being a sectional champion the following weekend, which is a huge deal. It really is. Um, uh, qualified for state. Um, Hunter is going to go to Simpson College. I don't know what you're majoring in, do you know? Something business related. Business related. He's gonna wrestle. He's gonna wrestle for Simpson College. Um, he was a leader in the restroom and out of the wrestling room. He was also on the Big Eight Conference academic first team this year. So Hunter Cleats. Again, we'll close up, but I wanted to say thank you to the school board and our community for providing us the opportunity to compete in educational based athletics. Uh, and thank you for allowing us to attend tonight to honor these exceptional student athletes. Thank you very much. Okay, we're at 3.2, uh, welcoming a new principal to Edison Middle School, Miss Amanda Spranger. So I uh, couldn't be more look pleased. look like Amanda. I'm, I'm definitely not Amanda. <laughs> definitely not. Thank you for noticing. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased to introduce uh, Amanda Springer uh, as our next president of Edison Middle School. Um, Amanda is not a stranger to the school district of Janesville. She's not a stranger to Edison. Um, was a, a math teacher there in ALC there, is currently the ALC at Franklin, and um, we were just ecstatic to be able to offer the position that she accepted. So, Amanda. Thank you, Chris. Um, good evening. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute to thank the commissioners, Superintendent Pufal, and the directors for this opportunity. Um, I feel very fortunate to have this opportunity to kind of go back home, so to speak. I started my career at Edison 22 years ago. Um, and as I shared with the Edison staff this last week, I never imagined I'd be in a leadership position, especially this position. Um, it was after my first year teaching that the principal at the time came to me and said, I'd like you to go to this conference, and I negotiated with him saying that surely there had to be somebody more qualified and experienced than a first-year teacher. Um, and I still remember him looking me in the eye and saying, we will be looking for your leadership in this building. Um, never did I imagine 22, year, 22 years later I'd be standing here. So um, I just have to thank the district and all the leaders along the way over the last 22 years, colleagues, uh, mentors. Um, they have truly been a shaping force in the educator and leader I am today. So I am excited to get into Edison and get started. Um, I want to put into play my passion for curriculum and uh, instruction, as well as invest in their staff and their students and the culture that's happening in that building. So uh, thank you to Jim and Nick, uh, the current leaders over at Edison, for the initial um, planning and Chris. Uh, for helping make this be a smooth transition already. Um, I cannot wait for July and next fall to start. So thank you. Okay, so 
Mr. Gardner, we have the presentation and uh, to consider the approval of the enrollment driven staffing plan for next year. Good evening, uh, commissioners. Thanks for uh, your time tonight. I do want to say one thing. We just happen to have Mr. Lemieux here tonight at his I know the principals, um, he's, he's probably crying about this, but it is his last board meeting uh, to attend um, after uh, how many years, 24 years in the district? 23 years in the district. Uh, we taught together at Franklin, and uh, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Jim, for all of your service to the school district of Janesville. It's a long time. All right, now on to fun and exciting things about staffing. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, that uh, this plan that you see, you know, this is just an overview of the, the slideshow that you have. I believe, Denise, thank you, Denise, for copying that. It, it, it really tries to summarize a book of about 80 pages. Okay, so I can kind of give you the overview of what that looks like, but it really is a team effort. Um, Director Menenwalt, uh, Chris, we'll call him Chris, not Amanda. Chris helped us with uh, with the staffing with the high school. We had uh, Dan McCray and his team. Tammy Carlson was integral in helping us figure out the financials, especially with the whole ESSER components uh, that were added um, both last year and this year. Uh, so again, I just want to say thank you to our director team for all their hard work uh, on that. Uh, essentially, what we look at every year is we look at our projections, and is your, what you're seeing in front of you is an enrollment-driven staffing plan. So we take our projections, we roll up kindergarten all the way up through 11th grade into 12th. We kind of have an idea of, through P4J how many kindergarten students we'll have, and we've been pretty good about predicting what that looks like coming to e each school. So we try to get our best projections, and it's one, one shot in time in January. Okay, and so that's what we base our plan on. And as you can see, it uh, looks like we're, we're projected to have 76 more kids in attendance um, at our schools next year. As, you're, as you well know, uh, if I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down or if you have questions. We, we have our board policy uh, in which uh, we try to staff according to uh, pupil ratio, TPR ratio, uh, outlined there, K3 is 21 to 25, um, four, through eight is one to 30, and then of course the high school is one to 32. I will say historically we have rarely, uh, typically we, we staff under those ratios clearly. Uh, and with the board's blessing, as you uh, approved our staffing assumptions in November, you gave us some flexibility uh, with regards to our elementary staffing, K1, because you wanted those ratios lower. And we also, uh, you allowed us some flexibility with the middle school in terms of the scheduling and allowing for a smaller TPR uh, in the November assumption. So we, we did try to take advantage of that based on the enrollment. We didn't necessarily have to utilize that, but it was there and we appreciate the opportunity for, for that to happen. And then at the high school, uh, we looked at utilizing again, some achievement gap reduction type strategies, having co-taught classes uh, in the high schools, which added some ESSER staff. So, uh, or added staff, we're paying for it with ESSER money. Okay, so the elementary enrollment, we're up 41. Um, when you see that teaching FTE change from 21-22, it is, we have 3.37 less FTEs at the elementary than we did last year. That does not mean that we're paying that much less for staffing. In fact, uh, we probably will be paying more, and I'll kind of go into a little bit of detail on how that looks um, here shortly. Uh, we didn't have any change at the middle school. We were down 147 kids. But based on our flexibility, we did allow for some of those things to, to accrue. As they fall out across all three schools, we move staff, we transfer staff uh, as what we, we need to do each year and, and look at that. So, And then finally at the high school, uh, the change is 175 up. So altogether, we're, again, 76 kids in, in the black for next year. We're up 76 kids and uh, have staff accordingly. Again, these are our November staff assumptions that you, you uh, approved. K2 flexibility uh, for TPR, flexibility for the middle school classrooms, and then the high school quota classrooms. Those are just some highlights that we used. And, and those did influence the staffing plan this year. I'm happy to say I have this slide in here, but I am happy to say we do not have any enrollment-driven staffing 
uh, non-renewals. So that's, that's good. People, we want to keep as many teachers as we can. Obviously, we have to be fiscally responsible. And if the enrollment doesn't justify it, then we, we don't. But this year, because of retirements and attrition, we're, we're able to keep all positions in terms of not having to uh, non-renew anyone due to enrollment. Uh, the cost, uh, and this is, uh, Mr. Dan McRae has a sign up called granular above his office, and it is a, a very true statement. Um, Tammy Carlson, myself, Kristen Ostrander, and Bree met uh, several times uh, over the last couple weeks to go over what exactly is yes sir, what exactly is local budget. And essentially it's, and Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of like a shuffle, uh, what do they call that? The shell game. Yeah, shell game, thank you having trouble coming up with the words tonight, shell game, um, because you're moving local budget over to ESSER or you're moving ESSER over to local budget. And that's what you've seen, the increased cost this year uh, for our local budget for teacher FTE is $872,960. Uh, when you add the para cost to that, it's $914,252, which is also in the executive summary here that I provided you. The ESSER cost to that staffing, in addition to that, is then $1,804,000. So of our current ESSER money we're using for next year, $1,804,000 for uh, staffing for our students uh, as it relates to those different pieces of flexibility at the middle school, the, the TPR enrollment at the elementary. We have the fewest hot spots that we've had since I've been here for next year. We have eight hot spots. That's unreal, okay? Um, financially sustainable in the future without ESSER, I, I really think we need to look at that, but right now we're going to we're going to approve tonight's plan, right? Hopefully, and and so we have eight hot spots at the elementary. We're good at the middle school, and then again, we're really addressing those kiddos who have some issues due to COVID and what have you at the high school. And you're allowing us to do that, so we appreciate your decision making on that. Variable factors again. Always we have number of retirements, resignations. We have those over the summer. They're ongoing. Um, the open enrollment, it's been pretty steady, but we don't, we never know. It's kind of a variable. We never know what we're going to get when it comes to those things, which then um, could influence our sections or, or our teachers. We could add, uh, we won't take away, but we could add some based on enrollment and where they fall within our 21 buildings that we have. And then any kind of unforeseen circumstances that may come up like a pandemic. So timelines. Um, you know, you've got lots of time. You have to approve the, the, the staffing plan tonight. Um, <laughs> but you've had it, right? It was, it, was a, it was sent to you earlier this week, and I sent you the, the summary. So um, ultimately, this is our last date for possible non-renewals. In addition, once you, once you approve this, we really will get moving on sending out teacher contracts uh, accordingly. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to put the cart before the horse and have you approve, not approve it, and then we already have contracts out that would obviously be disastrous. Uh, and then May 10th is our last possible meeting for final non-renewals. Uh, that's just a, a state statute timeline. Again, I've already said this, um, thank yous, but I, I do wanna point out, um, obviously, Bree Moran uh, has really, um, I can't say enough about her and her ability to pick up so quickly uh, this complicated document. Um, I've, I've seen, I've witnessed her numerous times in meetings with the high school, middle school, and elementary, just automatically kind of pick up terms that the normal person, it would take a little bit, took me a little bit. Um, and she just snapped right to it and, and got, uh, got on board. So I just can't say enough about her. Uh, the principals and assistant principals always are very helpful as they get student signups and work with me on, on sections. Kim Perenboom, uh, Angela Lynch, uh, Julie DeCook for the work on, which is no easy task when you're looking at title funds, P4J pieces, and of course special education. And Kim does a phenomenal job with that. So uh, again, I appreciate all their support and help with this plan. It's a team effort. And uh, once again, I wanna highlight Tammy Carlson, who really, um, I'm glad we got her back. Uh, she's phenomenal. So that's really what I have for you. Any questions for me? Sorry, uh, motion uh, was from Commissioner Murray and the second was Commissioner Millard. 
Um, Ms. Uh, Paul. Thank you for your work on this. I, it's not really a question. It's more of a comment in relation to some of the hot spots. And I'm wondering, um, are, well, I guess it is a question. Are we, do we look at some of our test scores or literacy rates for some of those hot spots and pay particular attention to if they're struggling areas as we are, you know, planning ahead. And I know that, you know, we're really focused on some of our, um, our, our scores and our student performance. And that's something that I, I, hope that maybe we can try to be mindful of because if we're seeing this and we're just a few off, man, um, we all recognize we, in this room, we all know the importance of low class sizes and how it um, absolutely impacts student achievement and also behavior. So yeah. that's just something that comes to mind for So me. it's kind of a two part question. Um, yes, we monitor the hotspots. I monitor them very closely during the summer to make sure that they stay pretty close to where we're at. If they go way over, then we have to look at uh, using contingency funds or, or moving or tran transferring staff over to, to cover that extra section. Um, but what you're speaking of is student achievement. Yeah. Uh, and so my job, at least as a result, uh, relates to this. Right. Is to look at what is our current TPR uh, in that classroom? Do we need to add uh, a section to break that up? or I'd be on the horn or talking with Allison to talk about, well, what, what's the achievement in that class? How can we help support that classroom without adding a section? We look at title resources. If they're a title school, we look at other different options before we just add a section. Because sure. that really does impact, it impacts the whole schedule. Absolutely. Schedule. So it's kind of one and the same, but they're two different kind of paths. Okay. So that's just something that, you know, as we're looking at that too going forward, I think we need to be aware of those decisions and um, just as a board so that we can help support that too with decisions that we make down the road. Um, and then this is something that comes up a lot as I am as a parent interacting and, and seeing things and hearing things just on the music end. I know that's something that was worked at or looked at or um, fought for before about having trying to have one music teacher at each school instead of all of these traveling teachers and you know I hear that that I'm spending this time in the car but if I wasn't traveling I would be able to be at one school doing this and supporting students better and um, helping with student behavior and um, and perhaps supporting the school in a different capacity. Um, so that's something that also I know doesn't necessarily help with numbers, but it is something that's always on my radar, and I, I hear that in the community, and um, that's a struggle that when I see that shifting around, that's a challenge too. Yes, and what I can say uh, to that is that we've been working uh, with the board for years on, on music staffing, and uh, one of the, the board's wishes several years ago was to have it as minimal of travelers as possible. And that's that's exactly what we have based on the model that we have. We have less travelers than we've had in a long time. Okay. Well, so, that's but we sure. continue to continue to look at that. <coughs> All right. mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, I don't remember re reading this in the document. It was probably there. There's three contingencies usually. We typically, yes, but uh, with ESSER this year, we did not include that as a request per se. We would, I would be working with Mr. Pam McCray to, if, if we needed them. Uh, for the most part, we've already kind of built in most of the contingencies we're gonna get oh, into okay. the staffing plan itself. Okay, and then my second question was related to ESSER. So there's 16 million ESSER-ish, right? Okay, for the next few years. This 1.8 is part of that? Yes. And then, I, in consecutive meetings, as we as the new superintendent comes in with plans and directors have plans, this is when we would t discuss allocation of the rest of the sixteen. Correct. Well, uh, yeah. Um, there's there's certain uh, rules and restrictions that the federal government's uh, providing for us that we have to certain timelines uh, that we have to. And Dan can speak to those more than I can in terms of the budgetary part of that. But we have to we have to create a plan, and we really, if we change it, we have to make. We have to do all sorts of different changing within drop-down menus and everything else. It's pretty, as Dan says, granular. Uh, Tammy really kind of works out uh, on that for us. So she hounds anyone who, if we have a change, the Tammy hounds anyone who needs, uh, has that change coming, why, the what, the where, the how. Um, so it's very planned out and very, very prescriptive. 
but yes, there is there is a plan, and that would be part of a discussion that we would have as a board. Any other questions? Okay, well, this is an action item, and we have a motion on the floor. Um, so we need to uh, uh, approve it. We need to re read the motion back. It's pretty straight up, isn't it? I'd be happy to read that back for you. Thank you. Um, the motion by Commissioner Murray, seconded by Commissioner Millard, to approve the enrollment-driven staffing plan for the 2022-2023 school year as presented. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. 3.4. Reading multi-level systems of support. Mr. Graff. All right, good evening. So tonight I wanna to take an opportunity to share with you about the School District of Janesville's multi-level systems of support. And I know many times a question we receive in education is what happens when a student is struggling in our core curriculum and how do we address those needs? So I wanna share with you a little bit about our multi-level systems of support framework that is aligned with our Department of Public Instructions framework and how that multi-level systems of support provides timely identification and assistance to those students who are having difficulty meeting the standards or possibly exceeding the standards in our core curriculum. So this model of multi-level systems of support is predicated on the notion that all students can make adequate progress and growth in our core programs. So if within our core programs that we can meet at least 80% of our student population through our core curriculum. So I wanna talk a little bit about that framework and the process tonight and how we continue to support students that need additional support in learning. And we'll more specifically talk a little bit of, um, in relationship to reading. And as we know, one of our key promises under student and school success is that 90% of all third graders will read at and above grade level. And so it's very important to ensure even prior to third grade that we are meeting the needs of those students in relationship to what they need for instruction and how we can build that strong foundation for them around phonics and phonemic awareness, decoding and comprehension. And so we as a district have put a process in place. So what does that process look like? That is again aligns with our, um, uh, the Department of Public Instruction. So as a district, we have always worked towards addressing the needs of all students and those students that um, may have difficulty accessing and understanding the standards within our core curriculum. So we've had many tools and resources and structures that we have in place, um, but we really didn't have them in one systematic place where teachers could access and understand exactly what are the district expected resources, tools, strategies that we have, even things like um, you know information we want to send to parents, and so. We have created, and I know Denise Jensen also has a copy for you if you want to see it, but again, one of those 80-page documents that is really more of our systematic approach that teachers have. So we're all looking for that same information on how do we address the needs of a student when they're struggling. Um, we created a three-part professional development this year for staff, so rather than um, just giving them this handbook, it's like how can we break it down and show them the important aspects of the handbook that will help them address student needs. Um, and as we develop that handbook, one of the resources that we used um, is the dyslexia handbook. And that is part of the Department of Public Instruction has asked that all districts have this resource available on their website as well. So really within that handbook, it addresses what should districts be doing when um, a student is struggling in literacy. So what are the specific um, assessments they should use? What are strategies? What are resources? And also parent resources within there. 
So we use this tool as well to make sure it aligned with what is in our handbook as far as how we're addressing student needs. And so together, um, again, I didn't develop this on my own. Um, I worked with a core group of teachers and staff, including school psychologists, Title I um, teachers, reading specialists, EL teachers, to, to really create this comprehensive um, you know, information for our staff and parents to access. So when we talk about our multi-level systems of support, we really think of it in three tiers. And so I shared with you that, you know, in this model that really we believe 80% of our students can be successful in that core curriculum. Um, now that doesn't mean teachers within the classroom aren't doing a lot of things to help support students in that core curriculum, whether it's differentiation, reteaching, some small groups. Um, but using different tools and, and strategies in the classroom that we can meet their needs. Um, now, we say that 80%, so how do we determine those students that need additional support? Who are those other students? So we do universal screening in our district, and so we, um, you may be familiar with STAR testing. And we look at that in literacy and math in the fall and the winter and the spring, and it's aligned to our state assessment. So that assessment tells us what students are moderately below and what students are well below um, where they need to be in relationship to their grade level. And so we have other universal screenings, especially in K2, as I talked about the importance of those reading foundational skills where we have phonics and phonemic awareness screeners that we're all using consistently across the district as a system. So we look at those screeners and from there we determined who are those students that have some larger skill gaps that we need to address and close. And we know that as we've um, experienced the last two years, those gaps have widened for us. And so it's even more important than ever that we really have a consistent system and, and approach and research-based resources that help close that gap. So the students, when we assess them universally, and we find out students that um, are moderately below uh, where they need to be in relationship to their grade level standards, we look at that as like a tier two. So the recommendation or guideline, and that's in our handbook as well, is that we're looking at students around the 25th percentile and below. So when a student um, is in that range, um, it, may, it could be, um, we say guideline because there are circumstances and every child is different. And so we need, you know, there may be times where there, we have to look at students outside of that as well. But a team gets together, looks at that data, and we determine um, this student needs additional support. These are the specific skill gaps, and here's what we need to address in order to help them close the gaps. And so we provide tier two instruction. So what does that look like? And again, how do we make that consistent across the district? So if you're a student that um, may be in a tier two level support, um, we consistently have guidelines again. So if that student is an elementary or middle school student, this time or intervention or support has to be outside of the regular core curriculum. We still want students exposed to their grade level curriculum because if they're never exposed to grade level curriculum, how are they ever going to access where they need to be and to be on grade level? But what do we do in pockets of support to help them get closer to that grade level? And that has to be outside of that core time. So in elementary um, and middle school, middle school has an advisory time. And so that time is used to work with small groups of students. And in elementary, there's a time um, throughout the day where most buildings find around 30 minutes in literacy or math where students are um, either support within the classroom or support outside of the classroom to get additional um, instruction and in addressing specific skills they need to work on. The recommended time allocation is three to five days a week for 15 to 40 minutes. I say 15 because if I'm a kindergartner, I'm not really gonna focus more than about 15 minutes on a specific skill. But as I get older, I can spend more time on that. Um, groupings, four to eight. So we don't want more than eight students. Um, we found that the research says beyond eight students, it's less effective for small group support. 
The duration of the intervention needs to be about 12 to 14 weeks. And then we monitor a student's growth bi-weekly in a tier two um, intervention. And so we also, as part of this document, have rec recommended research-based interventions. So teachers aren't going out and finding different interventions. Um, you know, uh, you, you can look all over the place and find interventions, but we want to ensure that it's research-based. And so those interventions are also a part of what they can access in this document. In high school, um, you heard um, Mr. Garner mention that we have co-taught classrooms, and that's how we're addressing tier two at the high school. It's a little bit different. It's team taught with maybe specifically two English teachers um, so that they can better address the students' needs. And we found through our STAR data that those students have been making some significant growth when there's two content area teachers in there. Sometimes they may just divide them into two smaller groups as well. So that's really kind of what our, our framework and structure is for a student receiving a kind of a tier two um, support and intervention. So then we look at tier three. So that's kind of that next level of more intensive intervention. And a student in tier three, again, when we do that universal screening, the recommendation or guideline would be students in the 10th percentile and below. So they're showing that they're maybe well below um, where they should be at with their grade level standards. So again, they have to be pulled out at a different time, not during their core instruction. And so once we recognize whether it's in tier two or three that students are um, you know, well below or moderately, we dig deeper into some assessments. So we do additional assessments to really target what are those skills they need to focus on. Also, in tier two and three, it's really important that we have a, a certified teacher or a reading specialist or math interventionist working with these students. So, we want our most neediest students to have access to the people with the most expertise in this area to help close the gap. And so within a tier three intervention, so what of those, the students that may meet that criteria? Again, a team is going to meet, they're going to look at their data, determine what is that specific skill that they need to, um, to focus on for that student to help start addressing closing those gaps. So how does that look different than tier two? So time allocation is at 15 to 40 minutes, again, depending on grade level, but it's going to be four to five times. We, we need a little more intensive intervention. Instructional grouping size really changes, too. It's one to three students. So we don't want more than three students when we're um, in more of this intensive intervention that we may need. The duration of the intervention is... Uh, again, around 14 weeks, 12 to 14 weeks, and we really need to do two cycles of intervention to really see if a student is closing that gap. Um, I mentioned in tier two, it's bi-weekly, we're monitoring the student data, so whatever skill they're working on, bi-weekly, we're checking to see the growth. In a tier three, it's every week, we're taking a data point at the end of the week to see if that student is making sufficient progress. So, for example, a teacher that would be working with a student in a tier three, they're going to have, um, again, weekly progress monitoring. So all of this data is identified and inputted into a, uh, we use an Ames web system. Um, and so each data point indicates um, how we've progress monitored and assessed the student each week on that skill. So you may see some of, you know, we want the, the trend line to show that we're moving upward and that we're really starting to, to close that gap. Um, and then you can see too, we indicate when the student has met um, sufficient progress in that skill. So for each student in tier three, they have this, uh, you know, we have a graph where we consistently progress monitor. So teams are getting back together after this, um, after these different data points are collected over time to review the student progress. So a question that also comes up is, so what do we do if that student isn't making sufficient progress? What if we've done two cycles of intervention and we're still not seeing progress? So, um, you know, before our next step is considering talking about uh, possibly a referral to special education, 
uh, what we what we do within our, our uh, multi-level systems of support system is first we look at a couple of different things. We look at do we need to change the frequency of the intervention? So do are we meeting four days a week for um, 30 minutes? Now do we need to meet five days a week for 30 minutes or four days a week for 40 minutes? Do we need to change the group size? Is it three students? Do we need to go one to one? Um, do we need to change the specific um, research-based resource we're using? Maybe that's not the right one to address the skill that it's to, the student needs. So that team comes back together, they ask those questions, and what adjustment do we wanna make to that intervention to see if we can help the student be more successful? Um, and then again, we do another cycle of intervention with those changes. So really our multi-level systems of support is really about looking at those three tiers. Um, we have that universal tier where around 80% of our students are able to show adequate progress within our core curriculum. In tier two, we're looking at some more targeted small group support um, and those students, you know, around the 25th percentile below, and then our tier three where it's a little more intensive intervention. So that's really kind of the system and process. Now, I could talk to you about it all day, <laughs> um, but I have to summarize in, in 15 minutes, um, you know, what we try to do within a system in our district to support students that need to make continue, continual growth and achievement. And it's been a little harder with what we've experienced the last two years because some kids appear to have more gaps. I guess a higher percentage of kids demonstrating that they have gaps now because of some of the lack of instruction that they've had. And so we have to remember that's lack of instruction. That's not due to necessarily um, something that they're struggling in. They just haven't had the opportunity to have that, um, you know, curriculum and standards taught to them. So sometimes it's a matter of giving students more time and finding pockets of time to reteach them on standards that they missed. So this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a comprehensive process, but it, it's, it's challenging as well. It's not a perfect system, um, but something we're always working to improve. So, so thank you for the opportunity to share about our framework. And of course, um, I'm, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address them. I don't know if you have data for this or yet, but given where things were at at the beginning of the school year with, with our, our students coming back from virtual learning to now we've pretty much had almost a full year, have you seen the gaps kind of um, lessen in terms of from where they were at when they came back, say, in September? So that's, that's a very good question. Thank and you. So, yes, looking at the data, I guess, in, personally, I, as I thought about, you know, our elementary kids were in school every day, too, as well. And so part of when I looked at the fall data of our incoming students and I looked at the literacy data, and I it was still about 15% below where it was pre-pandemic. And so it had really only slightly closed from where it had the year before. And so in thinking about what do we need to do, you know, we've made some adjustments in really some more focused intervention K2 around phonemic awareness. But I think the other piece of that is we have to remember 30% of those students were either not in school or were virtual. So I have to remember that they're coming back and their experience was different at that time. Not that they didn't have some quality instruction in virtual, but for f they were, um, be due to the health and safety needs, they may have been in an instructional model that didn't best meet their needs, but that's what they needed for safety at the time. And so these students now are back. And, you know, so I think that's part of the reason that we didn't see as much growth as, as we hoped to. So to be honest, it's not where we were hoping it would be, but um, we feel like this year um, now is really where we're gonna start to see some more accelerated growth. Michelle? 
Um, you said you have the full copies of this that we could have. Yes. I would love to get one, please, Denise. Um, great work. Thank you for this. Is this, how long has this been implemented, like, to what you just presented tonight's level? Um, as I mentioned, I, I don't, I'm looking at Kim, too, because we, Kim and I oh, okay. worked together on this. What'd you say? So it's, it's always been a, a system from the, you know, from the state as well. But we've just tried to get tighter and more specific, you know, guidelines and expectations that are consistent across the district. And I think that's what this brings. So we've always had to address learning gaps and we've always had similar strategies and supports. But now again, how do we continue to improve this and how do we build a better system that's supporting students? Right, that's what I'm looking for is a consistency across all schools. And I kind of understand, and I've seen it in action in the elementary. Can you paint the picture for me? Like, I don't even, didn't even know that my high schoolers take taken STAR. So how do I, like, how does that even get facilitated? How do I get copies of that stuff? And how does, how does this come to life in high school then? I mean, maybe, Liz, maybe you know, but I don't, like, how does this come to life in high school where there's 1,600 kids? Right, it's much more difficult structure. So STAR in high school, not every student takes STAR. Um, so I believe the majority of our ninth graders take it, but we're really looking more at students who we think um, we want to dive a little bit deeper in to see where they are at in relationship to grade level standards. So we don't test all of our students in high school on STAR, but we have Aspire that we use. That's more of our universal assessment at high school and, and ACT. So STAR is just used differently at high school um, than it is universally K-8. So thank you for that clarification as well. And then Aspire is the universal. Um, you know, we do dig into that data as well and look at that. Um, again, tier two is within, that, that support happens within a co-taught classroom. And as well as some of that tier three, or else we also have to find time within the high school day to pull those students out to, to address that really targeted intervention, which gets a little more complicated too as well. Mm -hmm. And my last question is, when is the PD and how will you monitor that it's being followed? Sure, so the team that I worked with to create this document, um, we created the three series of professional development together and really broke it down by tier one, tier two, tier three, just like I shared with you tonight. So then we presented that to principals and our academic learning coaches, and then they're rolling that out in, in three different parts this year. So we've met with you know principals and ALCs, um, and gone through the professional development, and then they they roll it out. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. Paul. Thanks for some of your questions because I was thinking some of the same, um, and I would love the document as well, please, that Michelle asked for. Um, thank you for all of your work on this. As you know, it's something that I I talk about, so I am truly grateful. Um, I have a few questions, and I'm looking at one of the things that came to mind is as these students are being tracked and recognized you know for like maybe they're in that 25 percent group and they're in these um, supported areas are parents being notified do they know that their child's receiving that support yes and that's part of what we wanted to be more consistent about and get better at as well too so and actually, I can send the electronic version because we have linked all the parent letters that need to go home. So a student receiving support through Tier 2 or Tier 3, a parent would be notified, and we have a consistent letter. So we're using kind of the same language and information and helping parents understand. So that was a part of being, not that different buildings weren't sure. notifying parents, but a little bit more consistent in how that information is delivered. That's wonderful. Thank you. I'm happy to see that. Um, another question. Um, so as like you're painting the picture and these students are being flagged and then they're receiving this. So who is tracking this at the individual school of who's, you know, who's putting in the um, 
the the weekly reporting that you you mentioned, and then who's overseeing that? And I'm sure it's rolling out eventually here, but like, who is that person at each school? Right. So typically, the person who is delivering the intervention. Okay. Um, and they usually work closely with our school psychologists as well too. But for example, it could be a Title One teacher. Sure inputting that data um, each week for a student that might be identified in the okay. tier three. So there's the designated person delivering the intervention or the team that they work with to uh-huh. address the needs of the student. <coughs> okay, that's helpful. Um, and then another thing I was thinking about, where did the percentages come from? Because so it's in the students that are in the lowest 25th or the lowest 10th percent, right? So where did those and why is it, sorry, Annette, 25th and then this is kind of a multi-step what's happening for the students that are maybe in the 40th percentile and obviously they're still but not reading at grade level I'm assuming because they're below the average so what's happening in those and where did those percentages come from sure um you know those guidelines for percentages are again looking at our department of public instruction around you know again recommendations and so as I mentioned it's a recommendation or a guideline so it could be a student in the 30th percentile or it could be a student in the 15th and a tier three because we also look at how are they performing in the classroom and how much difficulty are they having Um, so the students that are below that 25th yes because you still have that range where you know we talk about around the 50th percentile you're at grade level we believe those can be addressed um, within the classroom with for example during um, reading time in elementary, they're in guided reading groups where they're working with students um, at their grade. So if they're at a, they're a third grader, but they're at a second grade level, they're they're getting support during that guided reading time in a small group. So it it happens within the classroom. Okay, all right. As as best as teachers can. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for answering all of those questions. Yes. Hey, um, I have a a question. How, and I'm thinking at the high school level especially, how much of a problem is it these days or or has it been and is it growing with um, intentional non-learners? And how do they fit into this? It's a growing problem. <laughs> um, so I probably have um, Principal Lau here as well who, who may want to... Um, join me on this too but but yes that is becoming a bigger challenge and so again it's not necessarily that that student is in that you know around that 25th percentile or below it just may be that they're disengaged for whatever reason and so that may that's something that we have to continue to figure out how do we re re-engage that student and we can't say that they're necessarily they could be somebody who needs tier two or tier three but how are we going to better support them in the classroom? But I will let Principal Lau add to that as well. Probably the, probably the short answer is that it's the work of many people to get our intentional non-learners back in the classroom. My APs, my social worker, my dean, my guidance counselors, um, my support staff, we're, we're literally out sweeping the halls multiple times a day, bringing kids in, contacting parents, um, working with our school counselors. Um, we have a relationship with a mental health care provider that provides services on site for kids. Um, that's another opportunity that we're, we're funneling kids towards. Um, you know, unfortunately, the pandemic has really caused a lot of trauma within our kids and we're working very hard to reintegrate them and to re-engage them but it's a kid by kid process thank you very much any other questions okay all right well thank you very much appreciate it great report all right uh we're we're up to four point Zero finance buildings and grounds. Mr. Ardry. Thank you, President Myers. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight from our meeting. Um, first of all, the changes to the National School Lunch Program. The um, 
waivers and things, they'll be ending the last day of school this year. So they'll basically be returning to a paid, fee-reduced lunch environment, um, unlike what we've had most recently. So that's unfortunate, but back to normal along that line. Um, and I would also say um, the, the meeting really was, I shortened this because it was a lot of information. Um, Liz Lidl, who is, I believe, interim manager of food service. Is it, or, well, anyway, manager of food service um, is, has done an outstanding job of picking up from Mr. Deegan and continuing on. So just want to acknowledge her and her efforts. The next item, um, really along the lines of what Michelle was asking about with respect to ESSER and kind of what's the plan? Well, once you get past the educational loss funding and then what are you doing for facilities and helping with air quality and those things? So several projects were presented. Um, I had a view of how I was looking at things. Um, when I say looking at things, ultimately to address everything that had been identified for air quality, it's tens of millions of dollars. So obviously we don't have that, but to address kind of in buckets, what makes the most sense for the next piece? Well, Franklin Middle School is the only secondary school that doesn't have conditioned air. So that's like, well, it would make sense to address the air quality there first and when you're there. And in that environment, it also makes sense to address the windows while you're there. Well, what I just said is almost $12 million. The air quality in the windows at Franklin, $12 million. So then you're like, okay. Well, if you do that, and then you circle back and say, we've spent an updated Edison to a fantastic level minus windows. So, okay, well, let's improve the windows there. We get a bargain there. That's kind of about a million dollars. So that's a bargain. But when you put those together along with some other um, infrastructure needs as we think of the high school, the greenhouses, um, another potential spot to uh, help with air quality in that. You're like, okay, well, we can use all of the remaining ESSER dollars and we need to dig into our Fund 46 dollars to really facilitate all of that. So that's really what was presented. Um, it's, it was a sound plan, made sense to me, and that really the next step now is really so we're working with engineered, um, I would say, kind of estimates. So really we need to go out and get bids on them to see what amount of dollars are we really looking at to complete that amount of work. So that's really where we're at with ESSER, John. Um, we, we set, or the ESSER plan set $8 million aside for the air quality at Franklin. You just said, Franklin, right? Yeah, Franklin. You just said that it's actually closer to 12. So what are we going to spend the 8 million at Franklin and then figure out what to do with the windows and the other same projects? So it really isn't figured out. I mentioned Fund 46, so right. Fund 46 was uh, money we set, had to set aside and leave set aside for five years. Well, that time has ticked away, and now we can actually access that money. So I don't remember, is it eight or nine million there now? Nine and three-quarters. Okay, n n nine million. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, being conservative, we won't go nine and three-quarters. We'll just say nine. <laughs> um, so we'll have to use some of that to really complete the work that we identified. The project. Yes. Okay. Yep. So once we are really at a bid standpoint to say, okay, now we know what the costs really are, then we'll have to mesh it together from a 
expenditure standpoint or a funding standpoint. So, other questions? Okay, and the next item, and I probably should really, I won't pick on a principal, but um, Matt Knutson, thank you, thank you, thank you for returning to the district. Um, huge jump ahead from a financial information standpoint. So we still will see in the short run our um, financial summaries and board packets, but really what has been put together is a financial dashboard that um, primarily we can look at <clears throat> um, being used by the principals and they should be using them where they get pretty much information um, at their fingertips real time. So they don't have to wonder where their budget's at. They'll have it at their fingertips knowing where their budget's at. So as that gets rolled out more so that I would say we can get a purview of it, it will be really nice. Um, but he's spent a lot of time and effort along with the guidance of Mr. McCray um, of really working through that. So. They promised before the end of the school year, and they actually delivered. So that was outstanding. He really said before the end of the year, but we made it end of school year. So <laughs> that was awesome. Um, it was not an ouch. I'm giving him credit. <laughs> and uh, the other couple things, uh, two more things. Um, Dave Leader, the gym that we have in, in the work that he's doing, really – He's been serving as our construction manager with the district, working with Cullen and doing that. Well, guess what? He isn't able to do everything. <laughs> Can't do everything. He still comes in to snow plows at 2, 3 in the morning. Um, so there's items that we know that aren't getting picked up. And really, we need to really pull somebody in to really focus on some of the small projects throughout the district to make sure they're completed. Um, I know one that I have spent a lot of effort and trying to focus and get it in and we got it in and two poles fell over at Craig baseball field. So there's no batting cage and it's been that way. Talk to Mr. Leader about it, but what do you do? Do you follow through on that or do you focus on where more money is being spent? You focus on where more, more money is being spent. So looking at a project coordinator to come in, use existing dollars um, that we have to really focus and complete those things throughout the district. And lastly, we had a draft of a budget. I'm sort of pushing that at the start of the school year, we at least have a preliminary budget to work from as opposed to just waiting until we passed it in October, so it would be nice for people to have guidance right from the beginning, and Mr. McCray and his team have been working through what that looks like. So we got our first preview of that, um, so more to come on that. And my, my last note is, in the words of Liz Little, it was an enlightening meeting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Quick question. I feel like I am missing something here. Can I, where would I find a copy of the yeah, ESSER 123 and what's allocated? And I feel like I ask this all the time and I and I'm like, just, is it in one spot or? Right, so you may recall um, a couple meetings ago, Tammy presented kind of the overall ESSER uh, plan because we needed to meet a March DPI wise grant submission. Um, so kind of, I know we do a lot of shout outs, but uh, we pulled together a lot of information. Uh, Patrick and Angie from the Public Information Office have published that on the district's website. So if you go under the uh, community button, um, you'll see a ESSER subpage. Um, and so a ton of detail there. Um, I know even going back to gear in ESSER 1, Commissioner Murray would ask, you know, questions like, you know, where's the D 
detail, where are we at, um, and there's a lot of detail there. I am on the community page. Um, I don't see it, so maybe I'll <coughs> I'll follow up with you late. With, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I can certainly stay after as well. So you bet. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. I don't know who to address this to. Probably Dan. Can ESSER funds be used to supplement the lunch program? slides like us with Chevy Chase where he just went in and out of the microphone but never really gave an answer. So, um... <laughs> That's what you're going to do right now, isn't it? Okay. That's, yeah. Okay. I don't think I've seen that movie. Yeah. I'll get back to you on a reenact. <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in seriousness, yeah. though, um, so, you know, the, the ESSER net, if you will, is rather wide. Um, the issue during the most recent time, during right is the free breakfast and lunch for all um, so that's not really been a consideration um, I think as the plan was drafted um, just if you will with so many needs regarding staffing and facilities uh, plus the opportunity for people to go back to a free or very reduced lunch status um, that really wasn't a consideration okay I, I was just wondering thinking that um, if it could, given that I'm optimistic about our federal government and something could potentially change within the next year, that all of a sudden this could return to where it was, it might be a Band-Aid for a short period of time because there's so many of our students that are dependent upon that meal, so. Well, and it's it's true that we that we still have about, over, well, over 50% that qualify right that we're still providing those meals this was just but you're right I, there there is oftentimes that gap yeah, yeah i hear you. go ahead i missed uh thank you and some schools many schools do are did qualify for all of that beforehand not all but there were a number that did so, so many schools won't be at the elementary level at least yeah we could probably break that out of the board's desire um but we do have what's called uh tep eligible right so within the district um, every everyone qualifies for free breakfast right so the CEP is more of a full also lunch all right thank you very much anybody else all right thank you very much uh, moving on we have a I don't have any new summary uh, board requests um, and future meeting uh, meetings and dates um, Mrs. Jensen, could you help us out with that? Sure. Um, the only meeting scheduled is the May 10th Board of Education meeting at 6 p.m. here at the Educational Services Center. Other meetings are to be determined. Oh, your hand But I understand that we have a closed session and we're meeting at 4.30 that day? Okay. All right. Okay, um, we have reached the end of our agenda. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. So, so. student education. Yes.